Hello, welcome to David Galata, Book Dreamer. I'm David Galata, and I'm the one dreaming the books. And uh, today, as promised, I'm going to be reading from one of my books. This time it's Favored Son is Up. And this one is my most recent fantasy. Working on another one now, but this is the most recent one that's out there and available on Amazon or at the events I'm going to be at this summer. So keep an eye here. I'll be letting you know where I'll be displaying my wares very shortly. So here we go. Favorite Son is not a huge book, but there's a lot in it. There's a lot going on in this book, and it is all told in first person. So I figured it would be great just to start off with the very beginning. And this is just an excerpt, so I'm just going to do a couple of pages here. Nothing too long. I hope you enjoy. Chapter 1. Interview of a Wastrel Are you finally ready, my lords? Good. I do hate to waste precious time. Of course I'm not the original Galen Brightshaw. I'm his doppelganger. He's not stupid, you know. It's a difficult spell to cast, and he worked on it for a long time. Where is he? How should I know? He left me here to answer your questions if you're in the mood to listen for once. I'll give you credit for not killing me on sight. In any case, he brought me into being so that you could have a living record of what really happened and why. You can fill in your own blanks and decide what to do about your current situation. Think of me as an advanced form of homunculi, zombie servant, or daemon. The necklace that I'm wearing has been ensorcelled to force me to be absolutely truthful. You should recognize it. The damn thing was once in your relic archives, after all. Clergy and nobles, more like thugs and pretenders to me. You don't like my opinion? Then you must really hate mirrors, don't you? So many questions. Pick one at a time, if you please. I should start at the beginning? Well, that all depends on which beginning you mean, my lords. I could tell you the tale of Galen's birth, which was a natural one. Scandalous as that is. No mystic circles, no wards to keep misfortune at bay, which might explain most of his dreary life. There were no birthing jars, no priest or priestess in attendance, just his mother's screams of agony and his father's fretting. There was a midwife present, naturally, just to be safe. That's not what you wanted to hear? Then it's tempting to keep on torturing your perfect ears with the squalid details of commoner life. Fret not. I believe that I can tell what it is you wish to know, so I'll get to the point. No matter where you start from, Galen's tale is a long one, so have a seat and get yourself a drink or three. You'll need them. There should be some fine bottles in the cupboard behind you. While Galen cannot be here in person, leaving only myself to tell you all that I know, he truly wanted to remain hospitable for his noble guests. In that way, Galen is a civilized man. Perhaps the only way, but there it is. To keep things clear, I shall be speaking as if I were the original man rather than the doppelganger. We don't want to confuse the holy clergy of Otids now, do we? The current situation began just two years ago, though its roots went further back in time, didn't it? There I was, doing what I was always in the habit of doing, begging for coin and hunting the waste heaps for food. The chill of autumn was just beginning to let us all understand the inevitability of winter, despite the warmth of my tunic and hose. These poor items of clothing were all I really had, and were so threadbare that their spells could barely keep the cold wind from biting at my flesh. The summer before had been hot enough to make me sweat, despite my tunic's ability to cool the air around me, and I think the magic of its threads were beginning to wear off. Excuse me. Spells are such tricky damn things, aren't they? We rely on them for everything. Keeping our streets sparkling clean, lighting our way at night, unlocking our doors, and even helping us to digest our food properly. Only the finest spells are permanent, something I'm sure you nobles know quite a bit about. 
Most commoners must grovel, beg, and even steal the better magics, while you have access to many ancient relics of power and a can afford the services of sorcerers and witches for your undying comforts. I, like so many other commoners, had almost nothing. In fact, I had less than the lowest of servants. Whatever little my parents had gifted to me, or that which I stole from them, had been wasted on food, gambling, and the company of other wastrels. I frittered away my inheritance, much as I had disposed of any goodwill between my parents and myself. They were part of the merchant class, not as poor as the laborers, yet not so well off as the lesser nobles, let alone the clergy. They had sacrificed and saved all of their lives so that they might be able to give me a gift of coins for my coming of age, as is the common custom. I had promised them that I would soon make something of myself with their generosity, while hiding the fact that I had also looted their own savings for their aging years. I took it all and fled my hometown as if it contained a curse of great power. I sound horrible, don't I? I was. There is no mistaking the fact that I was a spoiled brat who cared for nothing save the next adventure of drinking and whoring with my friends. I was a sinner of uncommon tastes, and yet I suffered a very common fate as a consequence of my sin. I became penniless and alone. Spare me your sermons, and don't even pretend to feel sympathy for my plight. I don't. I deserved every bruise to my ego, every indignity that was heaped upon me by the shopkeepers and serving maids. All doors were locked to me, and I was forced to become a filthy beggar whose meager bed was the streets of whatever city was foul enough to allow me entry. It was a fine morning. The sky was clear and bright, too much so for my tastes. I had just finished rummaging through the garbage disposal of a small shop filled with delightful pastries and meat pies. The pickings were quite slim, and my stomach rebelled at the idea of swallowing another meal of tossed-aside leftovers from someone else's dinner. I had no choice in the matter, you understand. I was just about to stagger my way toward the next storefront when something amazing caught my eye. A large crowd of local merchants and laborers had gathered together at the nearest intersection and dropped to their knees in obeisance. A large blue carriage had stopped at the corner and floated a handspan above the cobblestone street. You know the type, a typical clerical transport whose angled wheels were enchanted to keep the gaudy gold-dripping cart above the material nature of the road. Eternal flames flickered in their sconces, the outstretched wings symbolizing the blessings of Otids formed a protective shadow over the cerulean blue carriage doors, and the jeweled symbol of the church hovered serenely above the very center of the carriage's peaked roof. Unlike a typical noble form of transportation, there were no bright unicorns or menacing manticores pulling the vehicle, just the light of God. This gaudy bauble of a carriage deigned to open its door, allowing a small set of silver stairs to drop down into place before the cowering crowd. I held perfectly still, crouched as I was in front of a waste bin, in the hopes that some righteous fool might decide to show his charitable nature before this representation of the church by giving alms to the poor, meaning to me. I practically quivered in anticipation. A tall priest, with his crimson, white, and gold robes, stepped out of the vehicle. His holy cap, with its five-pointed corners, was firmly placed upon his pate with blue ribbons flowing under his shaven chin and illusory birds swirling over his head. Unlike many of the other clergy I've had the pleasure of meeting, he was lean and dignified, and yet he had an air of desperation about his face that was at odds with his mighty position in our society. I wondered who this ordained idiot was, stumping his carriage at a busy intersection, while the poor commoners were supposed to be heading for their unappreciated labors. The crowd was deep in prayer at his feet, or at least pretending to do so. Some were undoubtedly taking advantage of this unusual circumstance to loiter and take a break from their scurrying. I noticed that he was of middle age, 
no more than a hundred years or so, which might explain his unwavering gaze that he cast upon the believers around him. No doubt he was quite used to the fawning masses begging him for forgiveness or pleading for the infinite mercy of Otids. Why was he not attending to his flock at church? Why was he here among the grubs? My questions fled my mind in terrible fright when his eyes turned towards me and lit like beacons in the night. The priest jumped down from his carriage and walked directly to my location. I staggered back as if he were a daemon from another realm. He did not smile, nor did he stretch out his hand for me to kiss his holy ring of authority. His bejeweled face showed a goodly pattern of glittering magical gems embedded into the skin around his eyes and temples. He had been raised in a, from a noble house, of this I was certain, and had chosen to become a mighty pillar of the church. Such men as he were never interested in homeless beggars like me, save to make some terrible example of them, all for the en educational entertainment of his lowly parishioners. Before I could turn and run, he leapt forward and grabbed my right arm, stating in a low, melodious voice, Please wait. I mean you no harm. You are Galen Brightshall, are you not, of Covingmead Commons? I have an urgent message for you, and a great gift. My struggle ceased at the word gift, for I was truly desperate. Yet I could not shake off the uneasy feeling that whatever business he had with me would lead to no good. I flinched as he pulled aside his robes, expecting to be stabbed by a flaming sword of God's holy light, but instead he pulled out a large satchel with a shoulder strap and a leather handle. The piece of baggage was well worn and scuffed, almost as much as I was. The priest just about threw it into my arms and leaned in closer, his hot breath whispering into my left ear, This is your inheritance from your father, not the one who you grew up with and who raised you, your real father. The man who seeded your mother's womb, his ever holiness, the Archbishop of Yorkvale. He died last night, and before he did, he entrusted me with bringing this to you. Do not speak. Say no words. This must be done quickly before my brethren notice our encounter. You are in grave danger, and for this you do have my sincere apologies. Tell no one of what has happened here this morning. When I leave you, open the case and read the folded note within. Touch nothing else until you do this. May Otids light your path. He then turned from me as I clutched onto the satchel with my filthy fingers, further smearing the soft leather of it. The priest threw coins at the kneeling crowd and began a sermon of blessing unto them. I looked around quickly, like a rat stealing cheese, and noticed a few faces glaring at me. But most of the people on the street were focused upon the words of the priest as he began to shout holy phrases from the great Bible of Otids. I took this opportunity to make myself scarce, running off to a small alleyway between the shops and their glittering windows full of pretty goods which I could never afford. I fell behind a stack of crates and sank further down onto the stone pavement away from the eyes of the crowd. And there we have just the first few pages of Favored Son. I had a very good time writing this particular book. Uh, it, uh, has a lot of humor in it. It has a lot of sarcasm in it. It's very sardonic in nature. Um, and uh, those people who have read it and gotten back to me said they really enjoyed it quite mightily. And I hope that you do too. Uh, so I hope you enjoyed that little bit of reading. Next week, I will be reading from my latest science fiction adventure, Stellar Trespassers. So that's going to be the next one that I read to you, and then it's back on to my usual program. I hope that you've enjoyed this. Please let me know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe. It really, really helps me. So have a great week, everyone, and I'll see you soon, and thank you so much for watching. Take care.